Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening. Yes, I thought you were here. Yeah, good to see you. Uh, my name's Dave. Hi, Dave. Hey, good job. Good job. Good job. I'm an educator here at the McCall Shepherd Discovery Center. Thanks so much to coming to our science cafe this evening. We appreciate that so much. In just a moment, I'll introduce Dave Brooks, who most of you know, and he will introduce uh, our panelists, who will introduce themselves uh, shortly. And uh, we just want to let you know that I gave uh, most groups that came in a postcard here to remind you we have great stuff because we are obviously celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 landing on the moon. And by the way, we did in fact land on the moon. If you have any questions about that, see me after. I got three quick points, 30 seconds, and you'll be convinced. Uh, okay. Uh, so this Saturday, we have our celebration here at the McCall Shepherd Discovery Center starting at 10.30, July 20th, of the 50th anniversary of landing on the moon. Uh, Governor Sununu will be here for a 12 o'clock presentation. Jean Shaheen has been invited for 2 o'clock. And Confirmed. It's confirmed. Not only is she invited, she has accepted the invitation, <laughs> which is uh, which is awesome. We have some PBS shows uh, to uh, to show you in the dome. We have uh, Capcom Go, which is a celebration of our 50th anniversary. We're opening new exhibits. You may have seen some of the moon dust shaking around out there. So it's going to be just a wonderful, wonderful day in celebrating the 50th. So please. Mark your calendars to be here for that. And uh, don't miss it, okay? Okay, because it is July 20th. And then we'll have rocket launches outside. There'll be places for lunch as well as launches. <laughs> see what, see what you did there? <laughs> okay. Well, without any further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, David Brooks, who is Mr. Science Cafe himself, and he will direct the program. Dave Brooks. All right, thank you. Wow, this is a microphone on a stand. It's much classier than I usually have. Um, but I'm going to give it to them, so anyway. Uh, so before I guess my name is David Brooks. I write for the Concord Monitor, granitegeek.org. Uh, I have a newsletter. If you didn't sign up for it, you don't already get it. You can sign up for it. Uh, and uh, how many of you have never been to a science cafe before? Raise your hand. Excellent. And how many of you, and you can be honest here, have never been at a Discovery Center before? Well, a few. Okay. All right. So I, I brought in some new people for you. All right. Excellent. Well, and so here's how Discovery Center, I'm sorry, here's how the Science Cafe works. Um, it was started actually by a couple of science fans, uh, Sarah Eck, who been getting her PhD at Dartmouth, and uh, some, shoot, I used to know the field, I forget it. Anyway, uh, and a computer guy uh, named Dan Marchek down in Brookline, they ran into each other and they both thought that a science cafe they'd heard about it in Europe, it'd be a cool thing to have in New Hampshire, what started. And so they kind of wrote me in. I was working for the National Telegraph at the time, and I thought, great idea, you know, beats going to a trivia night at the bar. Uh, it'll last six months and fizzle out. Uh, and that was eight and a half years ago. Uh, we now currently have both Nashua and Concord running. Uh, there are a couple other places they've started up. It comes and goes out in Portsmouth, uh, a science cafe. Uh, Dartmouth occasionally has one. UNH occasionally has one, inspired by us. Sea uh, Science Center, which is the museum in Manchester, they have one every month. That's been going for several years. So uh, I like to say that New Hampshire is the nation's per capita leader in science cafes. <laughs> and uh, I think that's, that's quite accurate. It's all because of us. Awesome. So anyway. Um, <laughs> so it is being filmed by Concord uh, TV, uh, the local cable access channel, which will put it up, puts it up on the sort of shared online space that cable access stations around the country use. So it gets shown in a bunch of other places. I'm told we're very popular in Salt Lake City. Um, and uh, the format is... I have all these things I normally say about the food and drink. I don't even say anything. There's no beer. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> there's, 
So the, the format is, uh, I'm going to introduce our, well, ask the panelists to introduce ourselves, themselves. I'm going to ask them one question, and after that, it's up to you. Whatever questions come to mind, uh, myself and Dave will be wandering around with portable microphones. Please uh, raise your hand, and we'll come to you with a microphone when it's time to ask a question so that the TV can pick it up. So don't just start, despite your excitement, don't just start shouting things out. Um, we'll go for an hour and a half, to up to two hours, uh, and uh, that'll be the evening. So, bum, bum, bum. I do not have a science cafe in, in um, August. We usually take the whole summer off. This is unusual. But we will be back in September. I believe the September one, which will be uh, back at our normal venue, which is Macris, uh, locals here know Macris restaurant. Um, I believe the topic is going to be about uh, electric cars, but specifically electric car infrastructure, because the state is trying to figure out how in the world to actually make these things work. So we'll be talking about that. It, it isn't just like how cool a Tesla is. Although, <coughs> I'm sure that will come on. Um, uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. I think that's it. All right. Um, so let's go right into it. <coughs> I'm going to ask the panels. Actually, why don't we start at the far end and work this way. Uh, to tell us who you are and why we should pay any attention to you. And after that, I will ask the first question. <laughs> no, that was the wrong answer. <laughs> so I'm uh, Dr. Mark McConnell from the uh, University of New Hampshire. Uh, I actually have a sort of split personality in that I'm also uh, part-time directing a small branch office of an organization called Southwest Research Institute. Hmm. And you uh, perhaps may have heard of Southwest Research because they're the organization that leads, for example, the New Horizons mission to Pluto. Uh, they are also leading the effort uh, with the Juno spacecraft currently in orbit about Jupiter. Uh, but my own work is in the area of gamma ray astronomy. So I send instruments aloft on high altitude balloons. <coughs> And I'm currently working in the midst of a very um, extensive proposal, which is why I really shouldn't be here, but I'm here anyway, uh, uh, to put an instrument on this space station. And I also occasionally teach a course on the history of the human spaceflight programs. Uh, I taught it most recently just this past spring semester. And I will close by saying that on the final exam, <laughs> I had a bonus question, and I've told the students more than once during the course of the semester that I was born the same year as NASA was created. And so I asked them to tell me how old I was. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody get it? I would say about, uh, probably about a third of the class. <laughs> That's an interesting introduction, Mark. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Eberhard Möbius. Uh, you may hear from my accent, uh, I grew up in Germany. And uh, actually, a good reason why I'm ultimately here, so that started when I was the second year in grade school in 1957, uh, when Sputnik went up. And then, uh, I read all about space and was all excited about that and uh, ultimately decided to, with some coaching not to study astronomy but to study physics and uh, that brought me into uh, space physics. And uh, I am a professor emeritus uh, at UNH but still continue the research. So I've given up teaching and the service Part, but uh, the other stuff still continues. So I'm working with the solar wind. So that's the wind that the sun puts out that inflates what we call the heliosphere, which is a protective bubble around the solar system against high energy cosmic rays. And the boundary of the heliosphere, that's the interstellar medium uh, which we can access because uh, the sun moves through that medium and uh, a wind <coughs> flows through our system. And I have been involved with uh, instrumentation that can catch that wind. 
uh, from the 1980s, discovering the so-called uh, pickup ions, and then later on with IBEX, so you see my shirt, the Interstellar Boundary Explorer, which actually got led out of the Southwest Research Institute, but the PI now moved to Princeton, and uh, <coughs> so that's where that to move. And uh, most recently, I'm also involved with the follow-on mission, the Interstellar Mapping and Acceleration Probe, which uh, is planned to be launched in 2024. And if I would have my brothers, uh, I would uh, uh, like to see a real interstellar probe that goes out like the Voyagers, but uh, makes it uh, into the pristine interstellar medium that would have to be, let's say, 300 to 400 times the distance of the Earth from the Sun. Voyager, so the two Voyagers are now at uh, around 130 times the distance of the Earth. Astronomers call that an astronomical unit, 130 of those to 120 of those. Uh, and the question is how long they will last. So they will probably not make it into the pristine interstellar medium. I'm Dr. Andrew Jordan. I'm also at UNH. And I am a research scientist there. And I'm on a team that operates NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Have any of you heard of that? LRO? It's been at the moon for a while. Yeah, Gene has. <laughs> um, and at UNH, we operate one instrument in particular. It's called the Cosmic Ray Telescope for the Effects of Radiation or Crater. I forgot to wear my shirt today. Um, I'll be wearing it on Saturday because I'll be back here for the uh, 50th anniversary. We'll have a little booth and we'll have some swag too. So if you want to find out more about LRO and pick up some stuff, you can. We'll have stickers. Um, so we're studying how space radiation, the cosmic rays that Eberhard mentioned, and also particles from the sun uh, could affect astronauts on long-term missions into deep space. And what I'm doing in particular is studying how that radiation can affect the moon itself. Hi, I'm Mal Cameron. Uh, I used to work here. I don't have the same credentials that these people have, but Dr. Mark and I do have the same taste in ties. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we made them sit at opposite ends. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, some of you I, I know, looking around the room uh, while I was working here, I would see you come in with your with your children and so on, and teaching classes and things. And, um, it's coming here that was uh, the best move I ever made in my life. I worked here for uh, about 21 years. I was retired in 2012. And uh, uh, for part of that time, I was a full-time employee and doing all kinds of great things, coming up with educational exercises and so on. But the, the best thing that I did here was become a member of a NASA group known as the Solar System Educators Program which is run out of the Jet Propulsion Auditorium in California. And through that organization, I got many free rides to lots of great educational uh, advantages at various uh, firms, uh, uh, bases around, NASA bases around the, the, uh, the country. I have been to JPL for at least four times, and they always take us someplace new every time. And the fourth time, they said, we've sued everything to you. We don't have anything else to show you. So I have a good time. But uh, one of the things that I'm grateful for through all of that effort is, uh, I think we're going to talk about it next anyway, is uh, the opening question has to do with it. And uh, I'll be glad to fill in some more from there. But it's great to be here. It's like coming back home again. So thank you for coming. All right. As I said, I will ask the first question. After that, it's up to you. And if you don't ask anything, it'll be really boring. So um, as I'm going to ask the obvious question everybody's thinking about, which is, you know, tell us your memory of the Apollo 11 launch. This will be fun to hear what you have to say. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and we will start with uh, Professor Mobius. What? Microphone. 
No, that was really an exciting time. So from the first uh, Sputnik, where the Soviets had uh, uh, made the first move, and, uh, and then uh, I was on TV uh, most every evening. I said, well, will there be another launch? Because now the US tried to get uh, uh, satellites up, and uh, to my chagrin, very often I saw a rocket going up and then coming down like this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but then, uh, after Yuri Gagarin got up, uh, John F. Kennedy made this announcement uh, to put a man on the moon uh, by the end of the century, of 1960s. Decade. 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 Uh, but then, uh, fast forward in 1969, uh, I was up the whole night with my friend from next door. Uh, we were in their uh, living room in front of the TV. So in Germany, it was the wee hours into the morning. And uh, we were watching, fascinated, uh, how Armstrong stepped down his snowy uh, TV pictures, but it was uh, so great to see, yeah, it worked. And it was at the end of the decade, uh, you made it. So that was really, uh, for me, okay, yeah, maybe I would like to be there to doing these things, and, uh, uh, but I didn't uh, really believe that I would, but later on I built instruments uh, uh, that went to space. So, but that memory is still ingrained in my if, Before you pass the microphone on, let me ask, actually, can I ask you one quick question? So, in Germany, was there a lot of attention to the fact that Werner von Braun was a big part of our space program? Obviously, there were some issues there, but um, was that, was that yes. well known to you? Oh, yes, that was. And uh, I remember, uh, when I was a little bit younger, I, uh, I, I always wanted to find things to read, and my parents said, well, you can go to the library. And I found this book uh, titled uh, Damals in Peenemünde, with lots of photographs about uh, the uh, group that built uh, the V2 and, uh, and uh, the involvement in the war, and uh, where they were now. So I was well aware that Werner von Braun now uh, was uh, at the helm. Uh, but uh, how much involvement uh, with the Third Reich was, uh, that was uh, partly there. Of course, uh, they built the rockets, uh, so that was for war. Uh, but uh, some of that wasn't uh, known. That was just refreshed recently, a few days ago. I watch the German uh, documentary, uh, and uh, I saw that several other people had much deeper involvement uh, with the Nazis, and yet uh, they were instrumental uh, with their Apollo program. Kurt Degus, the manager the landing uh, on the launch site, for example, and some of that, uh, no, I, I didn't know at that time, definitely. Be next. Be next. Uh, you know, I don't particularly remember the launch per se. I think the time of Apollo 11, to go back to my birth date and the first year of the NASA. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was about, I, I think I was between the sixth and seventh grade. But I was a very precocious sixth grader. Uh, I was following the space program very closely. Uh, I was cutting out newspaper clippings every day when something was there, probably even before my parents had a chance to read the newspaper. <laughs> uh, I do remember, however, that, that what really made the experience for me was the television. Uh, I, I'm sort of speaking to the choir here because I see most of you are my age, or maybe even have a year or two on, on me here. But of course, in those days, there were 
free networks, free channels. Mm -hmm. You know, when something was going on, you know, that all three channels, all three networks covered for hours. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for me that was great. Uh, for those of those people who are interested in watching the latest soap operas, uh, perhaps not so great. Uh, but I do remember vividly staying up late at night for the Apollo moon walk. Uh, the first step on the moon was at about well, 10.52 p.m. or 10.56 p.m. Uh, so it was quite late, and it was late for me. I probably was the latest I'd ever stayed up. Uh, but I think television was a really big influence on me. Uh, I had wonderful parents who let me stay home whenever anything was going on. Uh, so much to the point that I remember my seventh grade teacher wrote in my yearbook, I hope the space program has nothing going on when your finals are taking place. <laughs> but, so for me, Apollo was all about the TV, and I can, I can remember vividly each mission in the TV technology as it evolved from one mission to the next. The lost TV that we lost on Apollo 12, which really ticked me off. Uh, and of course, then we look forward to Apollo 13, with their color television. And we all know what happened with Apollo 13. So in my mind, a lot of Apollo was defined by the TV. So, so that was my experience. And I might add, too, since David left the room, and, and I don't know who to call on next, but uh, I'll add that, that one of the interesting things about Apollo 12, of course, was that they accidentally pointed the TV camera at the sun and burned out the TV camera tube. It turns out that that TV camera tube was built by Westinghouse at the very same Westinghouse plant that my father worked at. <laughs> and so I remember, you know, hearing that they had sent the two, brought the two back to Earth and sent it to Westinghouse for evaluation to figure out what went wrong. And I vividly remember in my head, you know, driving by that plant thinking, there's a, there's a, a, a camera that was on the moon somewhere inside that building, you know. So, so that's sort of what Apollo was for me. I think for a lot of people my age, my peers, it was a real, uh, it motivated a lot of us to do what we did today and may well have influenced my career as well as, as others. So. Want to save the kid for later? Yeah. <laughs> He's got to think of a good joke. <laughs> Start working. <laughs> My, my memory, I always remember sitting, um, it was the year I graduated from college and, uh, in 1969, and I remember staying up late, it was a Sunday night, and watching the black and white image of Neil Armstrong coming down the ladder on the moon, and just thinking how remarkable it was that they were even able to land in the first place. But um, as I'm sitting there, there's a picture window on my left in the living room looking to the outside, and there in the sky was the moon. And I'm constantly going back and forth trying to relate to the two of them. I says, God, it can't be that so far away. You know, it's, it's amazing. And um, so that image always stuck with me. I said, boy, that's just remarkable. It was such a great trip to get there. But jump ahead now to 2006. Well, I'm, in, I'm here, part of the, that uh, group from Jet Propulsion Laboratory, got invited to go to Houston, Texas, uh, to NASA headquarters down there, and uh, helped as part of our education group to welcome back a probe that came from a <coughs> spacecraft called Stardust that was out taking samples from a comet, collecting them on a little probe plate, sealing it all up, and then it sent it back to Earth. And that probe had come back to Earth that Sunday of the week we were there in uh, Houston. Well, it turns out that Houston is where they keep all of those special things that came in from space, including the moon rocks from all the Apollo missions. And our group 
was split off from the others and they sent one group the other way to go look at meteorites somewhere. Our group got to stand in the vault where they keep all the moon rocks. We had to put on the funny bunny suits to do it, you know, we get completely covered in special shoes and all that. Even our camera had to go through a special um, debriefing room, I guess, of some kind. But we all stood in there, and what was remarkable, all of those rocks are kept in hermetically sealed units with these big rubber gloves sticking out from them and not inside them because of the pressure inside. They're all purged with nitrogen to keep them um, from decaying over the years. And there were a few you may have read about recently that were sealed up tight and were just now being opened to see if there's any difference in making some comparisons. There is one section that is strictly Apollo 11 because they were on the moon for the shortest amount of time, uh, only about a little over two hours. And then they came back in with about not even 50 pounds of rocks that we brought back with them. But that was the first mission. All the others had two, and they were all labeled. And I got to stand in front of the one that says AP-11, you know, Apollo 11. And I could see the rocks that were picked up by the crew in Apollo 11. And this overwhelming thought going back to my watching that black and white TV just struck me while I was there, and it was almost brought tears to my eyes. To, it was a very emotional experience to actually see these rocks and how well they're being taken care of. And uh, that's my memory. What's yours? <laughs> I do actually have a memory. Uh, <laughs> I'm not that old. But my first clear memory of Apollo, and I don't know what it was for because I cannot for the life of me remember what year it was. We still had a black and white TV. Um, and it was a Sunday afternoon and my parents <laughs> hustled us into the bedroom, they set up the TV in there because we got better signal there. And we watched Neil Armstrong step out on the lunar surface. And I have no idea why it was on. We didn't usually watch TV on Sunday, but there we were. <laughs> and just all through the years, I did read as much as I could about space and the Apollo program, and it did inspire me. And it's really exciting to be able to actually do lunar science. And I think there have only been four lunar launches from the U.S. in the years since Apollo, is that right? It was Clementine, Lunar Prospector, LRO, and Grail, and Laddie, five. And I got to see one of them. I saw LRO launch uh, 10 years ago last month. We were far enough away, it just looked like a little uh, matchstick flying up into the sky. But we were there down at Cape Canaveral or Cape Kennedy getting to watch a launch from those bleachers that you get to see in all the videos. So that's actually, it was really exciting. Yeah, I don't know if this fits your time frame or not, but I do remember the 20th anniversary that they were showing a lot of the archive coverage, sort of as it happened. So they would have been showing, you know, the moon landing on a Sunday afternoon at four o'clock or something like that. That's so, what it would have been then, so yeah. would you? Yeah. yeah. Thank you for doing that online today. <laughs> right now they're, they're running the whole CBS coverage as it happened at some website or Twitter or somewhere. All right. That's it for us. I think, is that the one that's Apollo real time? Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. Is no. it? No. no. The Apollo real time has no water concrete. And oh. It, it, the, you're referring to something that CBS started that I just heard about, I think, today, showing all of their coverage okay. that they broadcast. Apollo Real Time is one of two online sites. Um, one covers just the landing, which is my favorite site of all. This one is just completely <coughs> insane. It has all of the audio from all of the sources and all of the photographs and all of the videos, and it's all mixed up together in one large site. And they managed to got they have audio from two sources going on at the same side, one on the left side, one on the right side, but it's almost perfectly synced. So it actually makes sense. It, it is sensory overload. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like a complete assignment. The people that don't know Bob Dylan's recordings or something. So. <laughs> it, it started from twenty hours before liftoff to President Nixon's welcome to the on the horn. Uh -huh. And it's just a totally insane site. I don't know how long it took to put it together. 
Well, so the one that's, is the landing is from forcemanofthemoon.org, and it's a lot more approachable. All right, questions? Uh, there you go. Mark, I'm about your age, uh, but I had the privilege of growing up on the Space Coast uh, as a kid, and I saw every Apollo launch in person except Apollo 18. Wow. Uh, it was amazing. Um, but my question is, um, Kennedy challenged us to go to the moon, and what was it, eight years later we are on the moon? Um, but it has taken over 20 years to replace the Tappan Zee Bridge. <laughs> <laughs> and how long did it take to replace the World Trade Center? 15, 16 years? Uh, my question is, uh, what has changed with us that it's so hard for us to do things now? Uh, I'm pessimistic and I fear it's uh, political and cultural decay that makes it hard for us to get this kind of thing done anymore whether we can afford it or not. I, I will just remind those who don't know that the motto of Science Cafe is no politics and no PowerPoint. So obviously we have to talk about politics, but just we'll be careful not to veer well, too close into live politics at the moment. I'll start off by reminiscing about the Space Coast because when I was in the early 70s, uh, my parents took to having our summer vacations uh, in Cocoa Beach. So I spent several summers in Cocoa Beach and managed to see uh, one of the Skylab crew launches in the Apollo Soyuz launched in 75. So, uh, so there a lot of memories from, from back then. Uh, but I, your answer is, a, your question rather, is a very loaded question. Uh, I think it would be, and some others perhaps can weigh in, I think it would be near impossible to do what we did in the 1960s today. Uh, I think the, the NASA today is very risk adverse, uh, which means that there are a lot of requirements in place for every little thing you do. Uh, there's a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of overhead, uh, and, and it creates a, it creates an environment in which it is difficult to get things done <coughs> fast. And I think, if nothing else, that is what is holding us back. Technically, we're more than capable of going back to the moon. Uh, granted, you know, the technology is far more complex today than it was. Uh, and but I think what's really holding us back is the, the risk-averse nature that has crept into the government. So I, I can uh, add to that uh, with uh, personal experience from uh, the different space missions that I have been involved with. The first one was when I was still at the Max Planck Institute in Dach in Germany. It was uh, empty, active magnetospheric particle tracer explorers. So it was one explorer mission, like Explorer 1, so the first uh, US satellite that got up. We built one satellite in-house, in the institute. And uh, that was just a charm to build my first instrument uh, for that spacecraft. We all worked together. There was very little oversight. And then, in, uh, two years after the launch, I got involved with uh, the ESA mission. Uh, so first proposal, and then it took uh, years until uh, that uh, got started. And then I was uh, flabbergasted what kind of requirements were there right from the beginning uh, to write documents uh, before you even uh, build uh, something. And then I moved to the US, got involved with the Advanced Composition Explorer, another Explorer mission uh, that was uh, supposed to be on the level 
of risk averseness, et cetera, lower than the ESA mission that was clustered in Soho. That was kind of the top of the line missions of the European uh, Space Agency. And here was an explorer mission. And uh, the level of oversight ratcheted it up another notch. And that basically went on with the missions that I got involved each time it went up. And then we, we asked ourselves the question, will we be able to do anything new? So, so the question was always, have, does that have heritage? Meaning, was that already in space? Ultimately? And uh, then, if it comes to that, then well, how can you do anything new? You want to add anything? Or? You, you don't want to piss off uh, NASA? You're, uh, <laughs> you're early, younger in your careers. <laughs> All right, David, I, I might add another thought that I had too. Yeah. Is that, that the aerospace industry right now is very, very competitive. And, you know, when you go through the process of creating a space mission, uh, the proposal process, it gets vetted and re-vetted and re-vetted again. They're concerned about quality control and technical readiness of the technology. Uh, you've got, it's just, it's just a cutthroat world out there. And I don't think in the 60s, I think everybody was sort of on board with one common goal. I mean, you know, for those of us who lived during that era when the Cold War really focused the attention of the country, and streamline the whole process. I, uh, your last comment, I think, is key. If it wasn't for the Soviet Union, it wouldn't have happened. Because America was certainly divided on many other uh, aspects of life at that time. So, so may maybe China will become the Soviet Union of the, the future and make us go back to the States. Got a question over here. <coughs> Thank you, gentlemen. In the 50 years since the Apollo, mission, we've had Mer, Skylab, three, three major disasters. How we got a chance now where it's probably better off to do international missions than try to focus larger ones just in one country? Somebody has to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should uh, start to, to answer this. Uh, so in, in your ESA, that's uh, really an international organization with uh, all the uh, European Union member states and, and more in it. And there have been missions like Cluster and Soho. Well, I'm not uh, talking about uh, manned missions right now, uh, that have been in collaboration between the European Space Agency and NASA. And uh, there are a number of uh, missions that you can't uh, think of uh, are happening. They're really coming to very big missions. And I mentioned if I would have my brothers, I would like to see a, a, an interstellar probe mission. I think that would genuinely be something that should be done internationally so that it's uh, possible. And you see that with many uh, scientific enterprises uh, like big accelerators at CERN, or if you look at the attempt to come to uh, nuclear fusion with uh, international collaborations to build uh, a demonstration facility that it's even possible. But I would joke about when I, I read first about the uh, uh, nuclear fusion, uh, it said, oh, okay, it will be in 50 years from now. So that was in the 1960s. And nowadays, if you take a look at it and ask the same question, it will be 50 years from now. <laughs> Yeah, I'll respond. Uh, your, your question was kind of a, a two-parter because you mentioned disasters. 
Uh, and indeed, you know, space is a risky business, and there will probably be disasters again in the future. Uh, I think it's 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 likely that any major venture into space will likely require some kind of international cooperation. Uh, I mentioned a few minutes ago the Apollo Soyuz back in 1975 was the first joint mission between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. And uh, the International Space Station represents an international effort that probably would not have achieved the success it has achieved without that effort, without that cooperation. It's an exceedingly expensive game to play in, and it's difficult for one country to be able to do that. Now, we can look now at what the Chinese are doing at the moment. They are building up the capability to do space station development not yet of the scale of the International Space Station, but they are doing that on their own. Uh, so we'll see what comes of that. But it really is, I think, the, the cost and complexity of anything approaching and going to Mars, for example, is going to require international cooperation, which ideally is a good thing for the world. Uh, Professor Jordan, I assume you, you probably work with other researchers internationally as part of your projects. Is that pretty standard? Yes, that is. And on LRO, one of the instruments, the neutron detector, which was designed to um, look, search for water ice, especially near the poles, that was a Russian instrument, which we had to get a special dispensation from, I think, the State Department to keep working with them when things were a little touchy with the Russians. Yes. But, and, and so when you're, you know, at the end of the day, when you're, you've got another international, some international people here working, or you're over somewhere else working, and you're sitting around with your beverage of choice, discussing cooperation amongst yourselves internationally, how does the conversation go? Do you, you know, despair that it's, ever, that it's falling apart, or do you think no science will win out, we'll always be able to join together? Usually we don't talk about that forward. over. <laughs> well, I, uh, you guys, yeah. do, do scientists, do you sort of despair that the world is, is fracturing, you're not going to be able to work together the way you have, or do you think that you will always be able to have international cooperation amongst scientists? Yeah. In general, I don't think we're all that pessimistic about it. We are just working together. Um, with Chinese colleagues, that's more unclear. I haven't talked about it specifically, usually, um, because it's kind of a hard thing to bring up. So there's always that in the back of your mind, what could happen. Um, so I haven't really talked about that with my Chinese colleagues. Well, so since you mentioned uh, Chinese colleagues, uh, I have been asked to uh, to help out with instrument development in China from Chinese colleagues, but uh, working here in the US, I can't do that. At least not right now. So definitely from the Chinese side, there is the interest uh, to do international collaboration. And if you look back at the height of, uh, of the uh, Cold War, uh, they finally uh, got uh, together to the Apollo Soyuz mission. But even if you go back uh, to Apollo 11, uh, there was international collaboration. That was not just a U.S. mission. The first experiment uh, the astronauts uh, had to plan on the surface of the moon was uh, the so-called solar wind sail. Uh, that was a foil with uh, aluminum and, uh, and uh, gold coating from the University of Bern in Switzerland. Uh, and I've uh, collaborated with Professor Johannes Geis, who, uh, who built this in his group. Um, 
So that was to get a sample of the solar wind that blows freely across the moon. And uh, that was on every Apollo uh, mission. And, uh, and at the end, they rolled it together, brought it back to the Earth, and it ended up in the laboratory in Bern, uh, where they investigated what, what had uh, been implanted into this sail during that uh, mission. What was the state of the solar wind during that uh, time? And uh, what's the composition of the solar wind? That wasn't known before. All right, question, I got one back here. And then we'll go up the, I'll go here first, and we'll go there. so much um, for your answers. I have a question for all the panelists. Um, I'm curious to see if you wouldn't mind explaining sort of in layman's terms for a non-scientist or someone who's in this field, why the average person should care that we went to the moon or are going to the moon or we perhaps were pertinently are trying to go to Mars. That's a good question because answering that question is why we haven't gone back. <laughs> uh, that's, that is a loaded question. Uh, you know, when, you, when we look back at Apollo, uh, did we go there for the science? Uh, it was not really driven at all by the science. Scientists actually were kind of, eh, you know, be okay if we went, but no big deal. Uh, it was really all about politics and uh, the technology that we gained from that, the infrastructure that we built up as a country during the 60s to do that, really elevated the level <coughs> of technology in our society. Um, you, you can go back and look at all of what came out of Apollo in terms of you know computer technology and so on and so forth. Uh, it is, in some sense, a, you know, I, I sort of sometimes think of it as a jobs program, but a jobs program with lots and lots of benefits. Uh, there's a lot of interesting science, uh, but it is also not just technically beneficial, it is inspiring. And I think certainly Apollo inspired me. Uh, the space program today still inspires people. Uh, it probably is a reason that, that brings a lot of them here to the McCullough Shepherd Discovery Center. See, I made my plug, Dave. Um, uh, and you know, I I I remember there's a there's a uh, YouTube video of Neil deGrasse Tyson talking about this. And he says something to the effect of, uh, you know, kids today don't talk about becoming an NSF scientist or a NIH scientist, okay? They're all great organizations doing lots of cool science, but they do talk about becoming a NASA scientist, okay? And so it really does inspire our young people today. And you know, I miss the time, Apollo for me was, was an exciting time. And I really miss that we haven't had anything like that since. Um, let me uh, add uh, two different facets to it. Number one, wanting to know what's going on out there, where do we come from, I would call that, that's basic uh, science. That's what we humans are there for, that we strive. We want to know where do we come from. So that drives basic science. On the other hand, uh, if we're looking at what we've learned in space, uh, going to the moon, to other planets, uh, with uh, probes so far, not as humans. We haven't 
kept our foot on Mars or on Venus yet, but we've learned a lot, and we are learning a lot about our own planet, uh, how that has evolved, and uh, uh, how vulnerable that uh, planet is. Uh, doing a comparison between the different uh, planets, uh, we learn additional facets that we cannot get by just uh, doing our research on Earth. On the other hand, we have made ourselves vulnerable to onslaughts from space with our technology that we need, that we think we need, GPS, uh, weather forecasting on uh, satellites, uh, power grids across the country that we don't get brownouts, and guess what? All this uh, can be taken out by space weather. And we are just uh, at the beginning of uh, understanding what's going on there. Uh, I still remember weather forecast in the 1950s that often was uh, hit or miss. <laughs> but nowadays they say, okay, the, with 80%, it will rain tomorrow. And uh, if it's uh, tomorrow, you can be pretty sure that will happen. Uh, that wasn't the case in the 1950s. So space weather, that's uh, violent uh, events from the sun that uh, can come and take out big transformers and then the power grid is down. Uh, we start to understand what's going on, but uh, in terms of forecast, we are at a stage maybe a hundred years ago with weather forecast. I got a question here from uh, Phil Brown. Good evening. Uh, I'd like to have a comment perhaps on the potential mining of the moon for helium-3 and what it would mean. More balloons. <laughs> Anybody able for that one? Nice and specific. Sounds to me like all the astronauts have come back with really high voices. <laughs> <laughs> The, the concept was that we don't have a lot of helium. Oh, I was using my teachable. The concept was that we don't have a lot of helium three, an isotope of helium down here, but the moon potentially does have uh, a large reservoir of helium three. And helium three is is like a fuel that can be used in the experimentation to produce power through fusion. So that, that would be an idea why I think the Chinese might be heading up there. You know, because, hey, why not? And then, then there's always The Moon is a Harsh Mistress by Robert Heinlein. <laughs> I've ever read it. And throwing chunks of the moon back to orbit the Earth. And, and basically saying to the Earth, leave us alone or we're going to pummel you with rocks. <laughs> so I always love that concept. But helium three, that's <laughs> so pra practical reasons for going back to the moon. Yeah. A little yeah. more general. Is there something that we can make money out of or that we can build from as a result? So, so if I was wondering when you asked that question where you are going and I thought uh, <laughs> nuclear fusion, uh, say, because I'm a, a plasma physicist and uh, that was one of the reasons why I went into that. The major reason was space plasma. Uh, but uh, when you want to do uh, nuclear fusion, uh, you're probably better off uh, uh, taking uh, lithium and then uh, turning that into uh, tritium and, uh, and uh, the helium-3. So, so that you can breathe that in the very uh, nuclear fusion reactor. Okay. So I have not heard the idea that you have to gobble up all uh, helium-3 on, uh, on the moon or on Earth to do that. Well, how, about, how about anything else? Any other so just in general, the moon is a big rock. 
it's silicon and oxygen, and we have a lot of that right here on Earth. We're sitting on a bunch of it right now. Um, so it's compositionally, it's not all that different from the Earth, and I know some of my geologist friends would probably yell at me a little bit for saying that. But as far as I'm concerned, and I'm just looking at it elementally, it's about the same as the Earth is. Helium-3 is a difference, and I know, especially in the 90s, and even since then, people were talking about that. Um, so it's actually interesting to hear from somebody who knows more about fusion than most of the moon folks do, um, how important that might be. There's, as far as going to the moon and bringing things back, yes, there's the science to be done with that, and we still have rocks that we have not analyzed yet. Mm -hmm. So who knows what mysteries await. Um, and speaking scientifically, there's also ice at the lunar poles. So the craters at both the North and the South Pole are hidden from the sun and have been hidden from the sun for billions of years. And there is ice set there. Um, and so some of that ice has been sitting around there for a really long time and in some ways might be a witness plate for what has been going on in the solar system for the past, I don't know, three something billion years. And so scientifically that's really interesting to be able to bring some of that back to Earth would be really neat. It's also possible to make rocket fuel out of water, and some of our rockets on Earth actually do that. They use liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, put them together and you get water and a whole lot of heat. Um, that's actually partly how LRO got to the moon. And so, and launching out of the moon's gravity well is a lot easier than it is to launch out of Earth's gravity well, because Earth is much more massive than the moon. So there's a possibility of doing something like that, actually building a way station on the moon where you could launch rockets from. That's way down the road, it's science fiction right now, but that is definitely a possibility. There's more than enough water to do that. But realistically, do you see anything that we could do on the moon that would <coughs> cover the cost of going there and coming back? No, I'm a skeptic on that. I know there are private corporations. Um, there's a meeting coming up in November, and there are private corporations that have representatives there, and they're talking about how there is some sort of way to make money going to the moon. Um, I understand, I think DHL is actually supporting one of these landers where people can send things to the moon and so they know that they've sent a little memento, like a, a kid's tooth or some hair or something. <laughs> My daughter has her first loose tooth on. I'm not thinking of doing that. <laughs> but, so there's that idea, there's kind of the novelty idea. I personally don't know economically how you could make that commercially viable. Um, there might be ways, but I don't know that. We have to remember that, that at the time of, of Apollo 11, <laughs> there was talk about PNAM was in fact selling tickets to the moon mm -hmm. uh, for like $20,000 a pop. Ah. So, you know, there is. As we've seen in the last 10, 15, 20 years, there's a commercial market out there for people to go to space. And so I suspect there's probably a commercial market somewhere down the line for people to go to the moon. Uh, if you were a millionaire and wanted to spend a million bucks to go to the moon, there are probably many people out there that have that kind of money that might want to take that trip. Is that, is that something that's sustainable? I don't know. I have no idea, yeah. but, but certainly air travel has been sustained over the years. So when in air travel we're flying to a place where we can breathe and from a place where we can breathe. <laughs> <laughs> well, we go to Disneyland every year too, right? So, <laughs> it's true. So, it would be something like that. So the new NASA uh, director estimated what? Uh, Twenty twenty billion to get us to Mars and some staggering number to go to the moon. I mean it's it's much more expensive, I think, than many of us may even think. Well you can take some intermediate steps, make it commercial and socialize people into the idea that this is not so this is not so far fetched, for example, for average Macy's and then get Saks Fifth Avenue and have them for a special gift for Christmas. <laughs> you know, something um, buy something for $50 from Mars or whatever it is, or send something. Uh, that would sort of social people are looking for interesting gifts. These would be cheaper, and uh, it would sort of socialize the average person into identifying with doing something with those particular 
planets. Well, that's an, actually an interesting thought. There is an organization that flies high altitude balloons. There's, uh, I don't know what the organization is. That they actually have would have uh, jewelry, for example, that they put on these high altitude balloons, and they take a picture of it. Okay, and so you can see a picture of this piece of jewelry with the Earth as a backdrop, and uh, and uh, they sell that for. That's how they make money for their organization. And and I actually bought my wife a necklace. <laughs> 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 If I could just add, I'm just thinking through everything I'm hearing, and uh, it seems to be NASA, you, you may know, is trying to get back to the moon by 2024 in a, a, a program called Artemis. And they're building their big rockets and everything. They take things very slowly. But the out, uh, end uh, result, as I understood it, was ultimately to get a small colony on the moon. And my understanding was in doing that, you could send astronauts rather than to the International Space Station. That could still be an option, but that has a limited lifetime that doesn't have too much further to go beyond that, 2024 or 2025. And then that should end that. But if you have a colony on the moon, you can then send astronauts there for really long-term outings. And you'd have to build structures to do that. And you, if you spread even more colonies on the moon, then you're going to need more contractors to send supplies and uh, materials and food and until you learn to grow food up there. There's all kinds of possibilities of actually living long term on the moon, which is what we're also hoping to do when we go to Mars. Uh, but that's a little further down the road. You probably have sensed that NASA is very conscious about saying, yeah, we're going to go to Mars three years from now. We can do that. There are some people who are willing to sign up for a one-week trip. Uh, you probably heard that, too. And uh, say, so, yeah, I'll go just to say I was the first one to die on Mars. You know, or something like that. But um, there is uh, a, a role for private manufacturers and so on to be sending supplies, at least, to the moon and make some money that way. The expense, of course, is going to be right up there, too. You're talking about the billions of dollars that you had getting back to the moon, the Apollo program itself. Um, I had some figures I wrote down before I came here. Um, the project Apollo cost at its time was just over $25 billion for that entire program, just the Apollo part. In today's dollars, that would be about $153 billion. What will it be to go even further and go on to the moon? One thing that's an advantage of the moon over Mars is that if you go to live there, at least your home is always in sight. <laughs> and it's only about three days away if something comes up. Um, go to Mars, that home disappears on a regular basis because you're further out, your planet Mars is taking about two Earth years roughly to go around the sun one time. So you see your, your home world going past you a couple of times. So if you went to Mars, that's another area entirely that's really tough. But you get other countries going. Realize that when we did the Apollo, um, it's because I, I was thinking back to when I saw the landing on the moon. One of the first thoughts I do remember thinking was, yeah, we beat the Russians. Yeah, that's what it was all about, was beating, beating the USSR at the time. And uh, Russia at that time decided, we don't care about putting somebody on the moon. We'll just get something on the moon. You may, if you saw the series recently, that there was a Russian probe that was sent to the moon in hopes it would grab some lunar soil and bring it back to Earth before our astronauts came home. Well, it crash landed instead and it never made it back. But, uh, so there's always this rivalry. That's what we all like and that's what we pay for. There were over 400,000 people working on the Apollo program itself throughout its lifetime. From, they came from all around the world. The components of the Saturn V rocket, all the different stages were built by different companies who never really talked with each other. They just went by the plans they had and guess what? When they all came together, they fit. 
you know, you had Boeing, you had Grumman, uh, and a whole bunch of other people who did Spray it. Electric in Concord? Yes, in Concord, yes. I read that in a paper. Yeah, it was once great. They read one. Once yeah. it was, <laughs> whoever wrote that was absolutely brilliant. Was it deep? Comment here, and then I'm going to come back to another question. With regard to commercial utilization of space and travel to the moon, there's a company called Space Adventures, and they're the ones who brokered the flights to the International Space Station for the space tourists. For a while, they were selling seats on a ride around the moon. They were asking $100 million, and they actually had one person lined up to do it. And the original proposal was to use a, a Soyuz space capsule with a, with a booster attached to it to give it the necessary oomph out of Earth orbit. But then SpaceX was talking about selling a flight around the moon again for that $100 million or so using one of their Dragon capsules. Well, since they've decided not to develop the necessary technology, now they've got their Starship program where they're... Uh, they have at least one extremely wealthy Japanese businessman who has fronted millions and millions of dollars to push that program forward, and they have a program called Dear Moon now. And the way that that works is if you are some kind of an artist or content creator, you can apply to, to go to the, join this program, go to the moon, and make art inspired by your trip around the moon. All right, question back here, and then over there. Yeah, Elon Musk and uh, Jeff Bezos and Richard uh, Branson, they're all interested in selling something on the moon, but I have a, a technical question. All of those rockets, uh, the International Space Station, the uh, things that we have up there telling us all the weather and all that, Whenever I go out and look up in the sky at night, I see some meteorites. And I keep wondering, what's the chance of one of those meteorites connecting with the International Space Station, the, uh, a uh, trip to Mars? Uh, we know that there's the uh, Kuiper Belt that has a whole bunch of big rocks that get released when the planet goes near it and comes around. What's the chance, however remote, that it could collide? And if so, how much damage could it really do? Um, so at the moment, I would say the uh, highest chance that uh, a satellite or the space station or anything up there that we send up there gets hit is by debris that we put up into orbit uh, around Earth. So that is uh, a, a far higher chance to get hit by such a debris than by uh, a meteorite that comes from outer space. So the little debris of uh, satellites that right in the beginning of the space era, nobody cared about, uh, so they just popped out things left and right. And, uh, only when we started to see what kind of a debris cloud that is, uh, we got a little bit more careful. So the uh, orbits around the Earth, they are pretty polluted uh, by that. So, luckily enough, uh, I haven't heard of, uh, of really big disasters, but some satellites uh, have been taken out in that function by uh, such debris. I have uh, Ken here with a question. Do you, you want, hold on a second. Do you want to say anything else in response to that? Or? Yeah, just really lighthearted. Oh. <laughs> LRO was hit by a meteorite or a meteoroid. Um, there's a picture, and you can actually find it on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera's website, um, LROC, and 
there's an image, and the way it takes a picture, it does a raster scan, and the picture of the moon is really clear, you see craters, and then suddenly it, it just gets distorted, and you see this wiggle back and forth. And a meteorite actually pinged one of the radiator fins of the camera and caused the whole thing to ring like a bell. Nothing was damaged, um, but it does happen. Cool. <laughs> Hi. Um, I understand the concept of people going into space for recreation or adventure, but from a scientific standpoint, does the human hand really add a whole lot in this age of technology and robotics? Or is it just more practical to send equipment to the That's one that, that I have my students sort of try to address. There's always been this big debate about robotic versus human space exploration. Uh, I mean, look at what we've done robotically in the solar system. Gone all the way to, we landed on, on uh, Titan, Saturn's moon Titan. Uh, we've gone all the way to Pluto and beyond. Uh, we've visited some pretty remarkable places without ever actually having set foot on the moon. Uh, scientifically, you know, if you look at it from the standpoint of science, uh, I'm working right now on a proposal to put an instrument on the space station. This is a, a project that because the space agency provides so much in the way of power and telemetry capability, uh, it makes my proposal a lot easier, uh, or at least my science objectives a lot easier. Now, one could argue that, that could we have assembled something like the space station on orbit without the human touch? It would, be, it would have been a lot harder. Uh, so having that platform there with the capabilities that it has, I think, is an asset. I was thinking more about planetary missions. I'm not a geologist. You know, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of, of, uh, of science to be had in terms of understanding uh, the solar system and its origins, the search for life. Uh, but I, you know, for me, going to Mars is about that stuff. I don't want to downplay the science, but it's also about the experience, the human experience. If I could just add, add to that a little bit. If, you, if we did go to Mars, the argument has always been, sure, we've sent uh, robotic spacecraft to Mars, but if we see something interesting through the camera on uh, say the, the Mars rover that's up there now, and it says, okay, we should go after that and get a closer look at that. So we send a little signal to the rover and say, please go check this out. And there's a little bit of autonomous stuff going that you can do once you tell it what to do within certain parameters. But it takes time to do it. You can't sit there with a joystick and just drive it because there is a, a signal going to that probe uh, at light speed and it takes uh, 17, 20 minutes just to get there one way, depending on how far away Mars is at the time. So you can't do, we used to do a little thing, Dave and I used to do this, we'd say, oh, we're going to drive this thing here, and then they say, there's a cliff, stop. So you hit stop. As it goes over the cliff, it gets, it gets the message, you know. So, <laughs> but if you put a person in that way, and they see something interesting, all they have to do is walk over and look at it and pick it up, and turn it in their hand and whatever they want to do, put it in their bag and bring it in. Um, the difference, of course, with a human being, you have to feed it, clothe it, and uh, provide other <laughs> necessities for it. As Input you know. and output. Input and output, yes. <laughs> but, uh, so, which you don't have to do, all you use is, is just power it up and tend it to go, but you have to deal with these time lags as far as what you're going to do with it. Uh, there are some upcoming missions going out to Europa uh, that are being planned in one of the Galilean moons around uh, Jupiter. Uh, there are a couple of experimental things they're going to do 
on the big moon Titan was mentioned earlier, uh, the biggest moon going around Saturn. It has a very thick atmosphere that's much heavier than ours, and they want to fly a drone in it uh, and have it be autonomous to all by itself, just pick up and fly all the way somewhere. On the other hand, there's a mission coming up next year, the 2020 Mars mission, which is going to have a small experimental helicopter-like drone to fly on Mars to see if it can. For one thing, uh, they've tried it in a low-pressure chamber to take all the air out so it would be roughly the same atmospheric uh, consistency that Mars has, and it, they got it so it would fly. But it's a very lightweight thing, and it's very small, uh, about the size, a little bit bigger than a Rubik's Cube type thing. It sits on the bottom of the rover that they're going to send. The one that's going to, um, to Titan is more robust, and it's, it is flying, but itself, it is as big as a standard Mars rover. So it's totally different uh, environments and stuff. But lots of really interesting things coming up um, that are there. But the human element, first of all, there are places you don't want to send a human. One of them is Titan. Right? Um, and, and Mars, of course, you, you know by now you need special clothing and pressure suits and so on. Um, because I, I watched the Martian movie, I know all those things. <laughs> yeah, and you need a human being for the perception, and the interpretation, and analysis of new things. So, so what do you think, if you, if you had humans on, uh, on the moon, could you do lots more interesting things? Or not, maybe. Maybe everything, everything you want to do uh, with, with lunar science, you could do without humans. It depends. <laughs> um, just thinking about what it took to get two astronauts onto the surface of the moon and then back, they were able to carry quite a big pay payload, and usually with a robotic mission, it's a lot smaller. And so even when we talk about sample returns from the moon, they tend to be really small packages. So you compare how much we brought back in Apollo to what the Soviets brought back in their um, Luna missions, which also returned samples, uh, we brought back a whole lot more. I don't know how much more. Um, and I remember too, Jack Schmidt. Yeah. 142 pounds in the Apollo mission? 800, yeah, I thought that was small. Okay, 800. And I do remember, um, again, I'm not a geologist, but um, Jack Schmidt, who was the geologist who flew on Apollo 17, the last mission, he's given a talk and I'm actually going to hear him give the same talk next week, so it's too bad I didn't hear it last week so I could tell you. <laughs> but he gave a talk about what lunar science would be like if the only samples we had were what Neil Armstrong grabbed. And Armstrong was not a geologist, but he did have some geological training for the moon mission. But like Mal said, they were only on the moon, um, out on the surface for about two hours. And Neil was able to quickly figure out what rocks were the best example of what was going on in the area, what was normal for that spot, what was abnormal, and he grabbed a really fast sample. And actually, I think before he even stepped onto the surface, he was still on the landing foot. I think he grabbed a quick sample of soil, shoved it in his pocket just in case. Um, and then even before they went back to Earth, they were going to close up the, the sample box. He took a bunch of dirt and dumped it into the box. So he was thinking ahead. He wasn't told to do that. I don't even believe that was in the mission plan, but he just decided to do that. So there are some things that a human who's on the spot can do that a robot can't do. And I think it's true vice versa as well, and that's why there is that debate. I don't know what the answer is, but I don't have to decide it. <laughs> All right. Any other question? So in terms of uh, what, one thing I haven't heard is, uh, in terms of humans going to the moon, uh, true or false, uh, maybe you can elaborate, are there people in this room that have pacemakers, who have had MRIs? Is it true that because we went to the moon with people, that we enhanced our pacemaker, MRI, medical yeah. technologies, so that there are people alive today because we went to the moon? So I uh, certainly would uh, see that. So the uh, challenge to get uh, humans up to the moon 
uh, to the space stations uh, to survive there for months. Uh, that has driven uh, medicine, the understanding of what uh, humans can do, what, what our body can endure, and uh, what it takes to help it to, to endure even more. I think that's, uh, that goes without uh, saying. So that's in the veins of uh, any challenging task uh, furthering our uh, technology. And uh, definitely uh, space has uh, done quite a lot, not just the, uh, the Teflon pen that always was uh, <laughs> There's uh, much more. And uh, so I, I can think of examples uh, from uh, our own uh, instruments that we uh, build. Uh, so, for example, for the Advanced Composition Explorer, uh, we had to, to build a collimator uh, so that basically getting particles through a mechanical mesh uh, in a very accurate uh, way. And uh, so we went to a company in uh, Massachusetts uh, to get that uh, etched by them. And uh, when we talked to the engineer, uh, and he asked me well, how accurately they would have to etch this, and I told him it needed to be uh, more accurate than 10 micrometers. Well, that's uh, uh, hundreds of a millimeter. Um, he frowned and said, hmm, we haven't done it that accurately yet, but we will give it the, our best shot. And guess what? Uh, they performed. We tested that. Uh, it was on the mark. And next we heard, even before uh, ACE, well, it was the ACE Advanced Composition Explorer got launched, we heard from them that they got a big contract with a medical company, namely they were the only ones that could meet the specification for a collimator for X-ray mammography. <coughs> and uh, that has enhanced definitely uh, uh, medical diagnostics. Yeah. I just have sort of a brief story. You know, in our field, we work with a lot of people at NASA and we get to know a lot of people at NASA, at NASA field centers. I spent a lot of time at, at Goddard Space Flight Center, and in the project I'm working on now and preparing, I, I'm spending a lot of time at Marshall Space Flight Center, which is where they developed the Saturn V. Uh, and so you get to meet a lot of really high-powered engineers. And the person that we have now on our project who is serving as the so-called program manager and the program manager is a very important person in any, in any program. Uh, she, which is also probably a big change from the 60s, uh, has worked on space station projects in the past. And in fact, she served as program manager on a project. Uh, I forget the, the acronym they used for it. But basically, she was the program manager on the toilet for the space station. So, and your, your comment about input output, sir. <laughs> we give her a lot of, I was going to say, we give her a lot of crap. <laughs> All right, before we go down that path, let's go to do another question. This is kind of a very bloody question, sort of um, in addition to the discussion. It kind of ties into what people are good for up in space. And a little closer to your mouth. One of the things that we haven't turned on talks with the wood with those things together waiting to go. There's a button on the right. Here. Okay. Better. Um, so this isn't really a question, it's sort of a vision to the uh, discussion. One of the things that uh, we've kind of touched on in various directions, in various little pieces, 
on what people are good for is what we've gained from them. And I want to talk a bit about the photography aspects of it. And the um, Gemini program, a fellow named John Underwood, I believe, started working with astronauts for getting good photographs from the missions. And this was something that NASA was not really fond of initially. They kind of saw this as an interruption to their planning, stuff that, you know, you wanted photographs to show how materials were behaving in space, how the equipment held up and so on. But Underwood realized that the legacy from the manned space program would lie largely in the imagery. And thanks to his efforts, and thanks to some of the photographs from the Gemini rendezvous, NASA began to get on board of this, and the astronauts were quickly on board of this. And they spent a lot of time practicing with their Hasselblad cameras strapped to their chest at Little League games and whatnot to learn how to aim the camera accurately and get photographs and whatnot. But from all of that is what gave us things like Earthrise, the Apollo astronauts were kind of climbing all over each other trying to get, give me the, the color of the cartridge and whatnot to get the Earthrise photographs. Um, <coughs> Harrison Schmidt um, was, and talked to John Underwood about what would be a good photograph opportunity going out to the, the moon. And Underwood suggested that a full shot of the Earth about five hours out of the, away, away from the Earth would turn into an iconic image. And it did. That's the full Earth shot of um, Africa and whatnot. Further later on the moon, being a geologist on the moon, uh, he was able to identify a lot of good rocks from his background there. He also had a lot of good things to say about Neil Armstrong's collection, like the dust at the end coming back in. That moon dirt wanted to have a lot of good information that people were not expecting initially. So at any rate, um, and the robots are really nice, really good, but we don't have iconic images of the moon from things like LRO or the other uh, robotic imaging systems. They all came from the manned space program. Yay, humans! Yeah, you know, it actually reminds me that Lunar Orbiter, several years before Apollo 8, maybe two or three years before Apollo 8, took an image of Earthrise over the moon. But we don't remember that. We remember the picture from Apollo 8 of Earthrise over the moon. And I will also add that the astronauts were not too keen about television either from the spacecraft. I could, I could add quickly, I like that picture from Apollo 8, because every time I look at it, I know I'm in it. <laughs> <laughs> were your eyes open, or were they closed? <laughs> um, what is the emotional cathexis in competing against the Chinese compared to how it was with the Soviet Union. Is it about the same? Is there some difference? And uh, in the competition, um, how spontaneously does one proceed? Or how much uh, does one have a pre-planned agenda that you stick to despite whatever emotions you have? Well, if we think back at the Cold War, so my own perspective was growing up in a divided uh, uh, country. And my parents came from the eastern part of Germany and uh, I grew up in the west because they had resettled there. And uh, over that was looming that the superpowers could uh, send uh, first aircraft with uh, nuclear bombs and then all of a sudden with Sputnik, oh my gosh, there may be rockets uh, carrying uh, nuclear bombs. And uh, the Soviets, uh, they have the capability first. So when we visited uh, uh, East Germany, it was always like going into a different uh, uh, country. And later on when I 
watched the movie 1984. I don't know who has seen that. Uh, so that was the feeling, like this movie came about when you went into the GDR. And then, oh my gosh, now they have uh, the rockets uh, sending uh, the nuclear weapons over to the West. And I think a part of this uh, space race was really the fear uh, that uh, the Soviet Union might have some uh, secret technology edge, and uh, now we, we really need to get that. And I think that's a bit different uh, than uh, now what's in China. When I look back on it, you know, I remember as a as an elementary student in the '60s having air raid drills. Okay, we don't have air raid drills today, so that's a huge difference between the Soviet Union and the Chinese. But nonetheless, I, I I'll put it to you the following. I put this to my students: How would you feel? If the Chinese were on the moon and we were not, <laughs> are you asking me? No, <laughs> in general, I think it's rhetorical. It out yeah. Okay, well, I know a lot of you who are teachers and like to throw back questions to us, but I want to tell <laughs> I, want the, I want you guys to be on the record. Um, do you think we should go back to the moon? Uh, you know, I mean, we as a society pushing, you know, getting humans back to the moon, and what should they do when they get there? And I'm not talking about in the remote future, I'm talking about the next couple of decades. Do you think that's worthwhile? And if it is, what should we do? And if you don't think it's worthwhile, say so. So I want your opinion, not what people are thinking about. I'll go first. Go now. Oh, go down. <laughs> what have I got to lose? <laughs> I'm retired. <laughs> uh, I, I gave that type of thing, you know, when I first showed up. We're not going to go to Mars or anything big like that. We're going to go, it's, I guess, uh, George W. started the idea. Let's just go to the moon. And that's been followed along through as well. And I do kind of feel that there is a sense to that, simply because it's in, a, in one way a lot easier because we've done it before, even though we can do it better and faster. We don't, you, you look at the, uh, uh, the tapes of the old Apollo 11, and you see these guys standing up at these big consoles, one for each console, and then plugging things in, tweaking and all that stuff. And all those people with a room full of stuff Today, you can do on a laptop, you know, and who knows what else it's going to be later on, do it with your smartphone instead, I guess. Um, so, give, put, put people on, on uh, that will long time live on the moon, at least there is some gravity, it's not like there's no gravity like living on the space station. So you, uh, you weigh one third less, that's a good way to lose weight. And, uh, <laughs> But you get, you get inured to that uh, uh, situation, and you can do some things, and one of the ideas, I, I think, was to have things you could orbit around the moon and, for example, assemble a spacecraft that will go to Mars. And there, to leave there to go to Mars would be a lot less expensive than leaving directly from the Earth and having to use all the fuel to get through the atmosphere and so on back into space and to get on the way to Mars from there. Following on, on that, uh, to just go back to the moon, I don't think that would be worth it. But uh, the moon as a way station uh, to Mars and beyond in the vein of uh, exploration. So humans have been explorers from the beginning that has brought uh, humans all across the Earth, uh, so we've been migrating all the time, uh, exploring new places, and uh, then finally in the 1960s we made it to the moon, 
And uh, I don't think we will stop there. So that's the part that's beyond the spaceways from, from that time, exploration. And uh, then, yeah, if it's a way station to the next place, yes. But just to go back, I think that's cutting it too short. When, when we landed on the moon in 1969, we were, there were grandiose plans to stay on the moon, to build colonies on the moon, and to be on Mars by 1984. That was the plan. Uh, unfortunately, right after Apollo 11 landed on the moon, the country started to lose interest. More specifically, the government and our leaders started to lose interest. Funding was cut back. So I agree with Everhard that we should go back to the moon because it's, it's exciting, it's inspirational, scientifically and technically challenging, but we should stay there. Much like with the International Space Station, we have stayed in space for 25 years, 20 years now, I don't know what it is. It's been a while. Uh, but we should do the same thing with the moon. Uh, if we decide to make that step to go to Mars, the moon is a good way station. But we shouldn't just go to the moon and call it quits. What if Columbus had come to America and nobody followed him? Anybody else want to take that one up? Or? Yeah, I guess I was supposed yeah, to answer too. I don't like this question. <laughs> it's a hard one. So I personally would love to see somebody on the moon at some point in my lifetime because I missed it all. Um, it's kind of selfish. Would you like to go yourself? No. I have no desire to go. And that's something, too, I was just thinking about it is in Apollo. Those astronauts paid a price. Um, if you ask their families, was it worth it? I think you might get a bit of a different answer too, and that has to be factored in as well. I can't speak for their um, spouses, their parents, their children, but there was a price to pay on a personal level as well, and that's gonna be the case if we ever go back to the moon again. It might still be worth it, but that has to be answered by those, by those families. Um, and I think I'm going to contradict myself a little bit. I would like to see a commercial landing on the moon with people. Um, when we talk about exploration, yes, even in exploring the new world, there was a lot of government support for that. But then eventually it was private citizens who were paying their way to get over here, um, at least in the case of exploring North America from Europe. Um, and I would like to see what that would be like on the moon and Mars, if that's even going to happen. Okay. Now, I, I actually want to jump off that, because we're getting near the end. I, I want to ask a question about that. What's the you answer to? What, do you, what would you, specifically, if three people, you know, a man, a woman, and a, a gender-fluid individual, landed on the moon in five years, what should they do? Wow. <laughs> If it were me, I'd say, well, that's cute, let's go home. <laughs> um, well, it depends on, on what's awaiting them there. If they're just themselves and uh, some baggage and they're in capsule, that's a lot different than having a habitat of some kind waiting for them there. And that would make things a lot easier. That would have to require a lot more pre prep to build something like that, which is. What I'm talking about, you have workers living there. And you were talking about you know, uh, the families at home. Um, I would, and would think that if you had habitats there, that the family would come to move. Move your family, it's like moving you know, to another town, except you're moving to a place in space. If you had your family with you, how different would that be? What would it be like, actually, if, uh, and it's bound to happen at some point, when the first baby gets born on the moon, and all they know is being raised in one-third the gravity of Earth. 
can you go back to Earth and visit your ancestor? You know, your, your you'd have to bring a lot. Hello? You'd have to bring a lot of different sized spacesuits. <laughs> yes, the belly beast's gonna grow. That's true. How many species do you have? Pampers in space. <laughs> well, let, let's, it's a, we're winding up. So let's, let's finish with talking about private, because we have the private uh, space exploration, and particularly SpaceX. I'm sure all your, all your space, you're all space fans, you all saw the video of the two SpaceX boosters landing si you know, simultaneously, and it was like you know, your childhood dreams come to life, right? It was awesome. It was incredible. Do you think that private um, space exploration is going to have an important role and an increasing role for the, you know, the rest of your life? Definitely. Definitely. In what way? Um, well, for one thing, uh, NASA likes them because they can do things a lot cheaper. And they, they're, they're to the point where they reuse a lot of their stuff, too. Um, Although I'm not sure I'd like to be an astronaut on the top of the... Yeah, this booster we're running on has been used ten times already. <laughs> Good luck. It's only flown to Mars on Sundays by a little Yes, light. right. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, I, I think that's a good collaboration. NASA is still working on that um, SLS, the, the... What does that stand for? Yeah. Space Launch System, right? which is supposed to be even bigger and greater than the Saturn V. In fact, it is going to be taller than the Saturn V by about, um, I don't know, 50 feet or so, something like that. It's, it's like 384 feet high, and this was 363 feet, I guess, for the Saturn V. This is going to be one big rocket. And, but then again, um, SpaceX is working on their great big rocket as well. Um, and the competition is helpful there, but uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm a fan of Elon myself. I'd like to see him succeed. What do you think? So the question is how... What, what role do you see for private space flight and space exploration for the rest of your career? You, you can be working with uh, you know, Elon Musk Jr. by the time you're silver hair. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Elon plays his cards really close to his chest. <laughs> so I don't know what's going on. So for example, one of the meetings I go to each year, um, it's a lunar focused meeting. And like I mentioned, private um, companies send representatives to this meeting. SpaceX is usually not represented there. Um, it tends to be smaller corporations. And I personally am not convinced that they have great um, commercially viable plans for going to the moon and staying there. Now some of them are going to be providing landers um, for NASA instruments, hopefully, in the near future. As far as what somebody like SpaceX, who's actually launching rockets and landing them, which is crazy, it's very exciting, it's as close as I'm going to get to seeing Apollo. Um, I don't know what they're going to do right now. They don't really have plans to go to the moon. There is. Um, Dear Moon that you mentioned, although I have heard that the person who is paying for flights is in financial difficulty. I don't know if that's the case, but... So I just, I don't know commercially what could happen other than trips to Disneyland. And I hope it's not just that. <laughs> but it's a start. So, so realistically, you expect to be working with the U.S. government in order to do anything in space for the rest of your career? Or governments? Probably. On the science side, yeah, I don't think commercial um, space exploration is going to do a whole lot for science. So, uh, what I would see is uh, that with the competition uh, price for launching payloads can come down. And that's good for research in space because it has gotten really, really expensive with, with all the uh, requirements on top and with the launch segment, uh, the price can come down, that's a good sign. Probably they will make their money out of uh, commercial flights with weather satellites, uh, uh, GPS satellites, you name it. Uh, there's a lot that wasn't visible when the space started. 
but whether they will make money going to the moon, bringing tourists up there, or maybe even beyond, I'm uh, skeptical about that. I would say that they're definitely going to play a major role. I would say that they already currently are playing a major role. I would also say that they're probably not very welcomed by NASA because <coughs> NASA's been working on this SLS launch system quite some time. And then here comes along this upstart Elon Musk and SpaceX and develops the Falcon Heavy launch vehicle, uh, which is well ahead of, of schedule relative to SLS. So it is competition, but I think there's probably a segment at NASA that is threatened by that competition. And uh, they are already doing commercial work. The project that I'm working on for the space station if all goes well and our project gets accepted for flight, uh, would probably be launched by a Falcon 9 rocket. They are already providing services to NASA. They will probably within the next year or so demonstrate that they can fly humans to the International Space Station at a time when NASA itself can't. So I think, you know, whether they start making money taking people to the moon or not, they're here to stay. And I think that they have injected uh, a lot of, of uh, vitality into the program. You can just watch when they do their broadcasts. You'll see that the employees at SpaceX have an average age that is far younger than the people in this room and the people in this room are probably a better cross-section of the age of NASA engineers. So, uh, and there's a lot of enthusiasm in that bunch. Now, I understand they work really, really, really hard and get really worn out really quickly, but there's a lot of enthusiasm. Excellent. Well, I think that is going to wind up a lot of enthusiasm here. You got a real quick one? Or? I do. I have a quick one. Yeah. In relation to um, oh, the main person of Elon Musk, um, he lacks the discipline and the well, aesthetic but, quality of a real scientist. And you say the real scientists have some bad, some um, deficits to them, but they have what it takes to remain with a project. For example, Elon Musk has a significant other Amber Heard. Well, let's, let's not get into Elon Musk. He's, he's, a, he's a whole science cafe all by himself. So. Okay, well, they, go, they get on pop together, and, you know, they, they just are there smoking and they have a <laughs> Anyway, so uh, uh, I think we have a lot of enthusiasm in this room about uh, space of, uh, of all sorts. And does anybody want to make any quick last statement? Or do you all want to go home because it's pushing on the clock? If I may put in a plug. Absolutely. Uh, tomorrow morning, uh, you'll hear kind of a rehash of this conversation because I'm one of the guests on Laura Tanoy's uh, oh, show tomorrow. Nice. We're going to do a show about the uh, about the Apollo stuff. Now, they are doing their car raffle in between, so <laughs> there will be short little snippets. <laughs> Then we catch our breath, we go out and drive around the driveway, and then we go back up and finish the show. But if you're listening, it's at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. We'd love to have you listen in and call in to the show. All righty. Well, that's it. Well, let's give a... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.